Hello, uh, this is uh, muted. Uh, I don't know. We could not hear you. Okay, okay. We okay. All right. We will restart. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, good morning and welcome to Chai and Why. 11 o'clock, first Sunday of the month. We are back at Prithvi Theatre in person. And uh, all those who are joining online, welcome as well. It's great to have you all, except there'll be no Chai. But you can keep asking questions. The Why is always there. If you are the online audience, please remember we can't really see you. So please type in your questions in the chat box or comments on YouTube or uh, you know Facebook or Zoom, wherever you're watching. Type in your comments and we will uh, read them out over here. Uh, at the end of the thing, we may allow you to unmute and ask, but let's see how it goes. Uh, the way we do it is like this. Uh, we will, of course, allow questions. If it's an important question, quick clarification, do raise your hand even if you're here. Uh, I think Sharana will speak for about... 45 minutes or so you plan like uh, this. Round. That time we play a game and all that as well. Uh, oh, shit. sorry, you're not supposed to give that out. Oh, well. Okay. Well, now they're here. They know they're here. Okay. And uh, then we will first take the online questions. Uh, we'll see how many there are. And then we will sort of stop the live stream and then go for chai and come back. And then you can, you know, badger him with questions till one o'clock. Uh, they will throw us out at one o'clock. That's sharp, hard sharp. Then. sharp because there's, as you can see, there is another play coming up uh, this afternoon. So, uh, in case anybody is watching us for the first time, Chai and Y happens uh, the first Sunday here at Prithvi Theatre. The good news is, from this month, the mid-month session at Ruparel College is also in person. We've got permission to be there in person, and given that March is the holy month, H O L I. Uh, the March 20th session is going to be something on color. Uh, Kunika will be doing a session which will be probably also involving some little experiments that we'll do to explore the world of color. That's happening two weeks from now. Uh, April 3rd, we will be back here and I think that we will finalize uh, in the next couple of days. We'll announce it. Just keep following us. Best way to follow us is Twitter or Facebook at ChaiNY or send us an email. We can put you on an email. Uh, give us your email address. We can put you on an email list, etc. So with that, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Sharad Namoitra, who is a uh, research scholar or a PhD student at BIFR. And this is his third Chai and Y, but first in-person Chai and Y. He's already told us about Penrose's Nobel Prize online and also about uh, uh, Giorgio Parisi's Nobel Prize online. And it's a pleasure to have him in person telling us about the ultimate speed limit and the theory of relativity. Uh, Sharad did his... Uh, sort of integrated masters or whatever it's called it from uh, Center for Basic Sciences in Kalina over here, though I think he's from Kolkata. Yeah. Uh, then he uh, had an interesting detour. Uh, he went to Pisa for a while uh, and then uh, worked as a risk analyst for a while, eventually decided physics PhD is a good thing to do and came back to TIFR and is working on some area between quantum entanglement and statistical physics, etc., etc. But today he's going to tell us about the uh, special theory of relativity, I think it's all about. Yes. So with that, over to you. Okay. And uh, I hope you can hear us and things. Please put comments online. I'll be monitoring it online from now. Okay. Thank you, Anna, for the introduction. And uh, thank you for giving them a short story about me, which I didn't look forward to. But uh, so welcome. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about the ultimate speed limit. And like you heard a lot of big words from Arnav about what I do probably sounds intimidating, good to me as well. So we're not going to talk about anything about that. We're just going to talk about what happens when you go really fast. So let's move on. The first stop is obviously my thing getting stuck. And our next stop is the next slide. So 1905, a curious patent officer clerks, clerk takes the physics world by storm. In the same year, he publishes four papers, one on the photoelectric effect, one on Brownian motion, one on the special theory of relativity, and one on mass energy, UP balance. So if you look at the dates here, this is June, July, September, and November. And it turns out that all four of these are landmark papers which changed the conception of physics that we have today. Each of them were revolutionary to the point that this one over here actually won him the Nobel Prize. And in fact, this is, well, you can't really make a sort of scale between them, but 
there are much more fantastical things that this person has done as well. Of course, the person doesn't need any introduction. His name is synonymous being, with being smart or intelligent. Uh, he's Albert Einstein. Now, today we'll be talking about just this part, the special theory of relativity and this famous E equal to MC squared that probably you've seen in all possible memes and this and that and whatnot. But as I told you, uh, this one won him the Nobel Prize in 1921. But then moving on, what did he actually say in the special theory? So what I'm trying to tell you is that this entire theory which revolutionized how people think about what happens at different velocity scales actually starts with just two questions. The first one, the first paragraph is basically a quote from Einstein's paper himself, translated from German, of course. But then the crux of it is that physical laws are the same in every inertial frame. I'm going to define what inertial frame is for you in a moment, but bear with me. All I'm trying to say is that there is something called frames. You can think of them as perspectives, different people's perspectives. So for example, uh, say you from the audience, the rules that you're seeing over here from your perspective and the rules I would see when I was walking from my perspective, they would be exactly the same. Now, there's a second thing, which is the speed of light is the same for every inertial observer. Going back to the same example, the speed of light he will measure or she will measure or they will measure is the same speed that I will measure in my perspective as well. There's only one catch, which is the fact that it has to be an inertial thing, meaning that I can only move at constant velocities with respect to each other. If I'm accelerating, say I'm in a car and I'm having a joyride, which I shouldn't, if the is watching, uh, then this won't work. But as long as people are moving at constant velocities with respect to each other, everything is fine. So these are the two questions. So the first one is actually not that not new to Einstein. It was there since Galileo's time, which is like 1600 something, the early 1600s. And this laid the framework for Newtonian dynamics, uh, Newtonian laws of motion, which probably all of you have suffered through during school at some level or the other. So let us first look at the first principle. We're going to go to the second one. The second one is the true revolutionary concept that you put in. Uh, so let's look at the first one. What does it even mean? So let me just define what uh, inertial frame of reference is you basically have a perspective. You have some x axis and a y axis. Um, you have some object happening here. For example, suppose the fact that I'm standing here, or the fact that I say I'm about to drop this thing, sight, no, I'm not. But so suppose this is the event that happened, and say this person was looking from that frame versus something somebody else moving at a constant velocity is looking at the same thing. How are these two events? How are they related to each other? How would you describe them? How are the descriptions in two different frames related to each other? And it's quite simple. I mean, it's just parallelly shifted. So if this distance was x and this thing was moving at velocity v, and this is observed at time t, this distance is d times t. Simple as that. And this is just the offset of this guy. So suppose there's one guy here, another person there. So it's just the difference between them. That's it. Simple as that. However, there's one crucial thing that the time that is going for me and the other person is the same. It also makes sense. It's quite normal, uh, unless your watches are a bit weird, but usually. So now, the point is that frames are all the same. There's nothing special about the frame. In every frame, for example, Newton's laws of motion will work. Of course, the quantities that you measure will be different, but they will fit the same law. Meaning that, say, a law would be something like Newton's second law, which says that the force is equal to the rate of change of the momentum. Of course, I, for a certain event, will measure the force to be something, will measure the momentum to be something, and they will be related exactly in some way, F equal to rate of change of momentum. The other person will measure a different force. They will measure a different momentum, but they will also be related by F equal to rate of change of momentum. So the principle remains the same, the numbers can change. That is the main point of invariance. So this is also known as Galilean invariance. So this is another, I'm driving on the point that all frames have the same time over here. And every, every measurement is relative at the end of the day, meaning that all I can measure is like length from here or time from a certain point. I, I don't have a concept of absolute time or absolute measure or absolute anything. 
but then if, if it's always relative to something, I can keep on doing that argument over and over and over and over again till I'm starting to ask, okay, what is the thing I am relative to at the end? Is there an absolute thing with which I'm measuring everything? To give you an example, suppose I'm moving, suppose I'm standing over here, but we know the earth is rotating, right? So from the perspective of the sun, we are rotating plus we are revolving. So I'm not at rest right now. Technically, I'm whizzing around the sun. The sun itself is now whizzing along the galactic center. So it's all about relative. But then I can keep making it larger and larger and larger till, of course, I don't have an answer. For this. Now, this is what people were worried about around the turn of the 18th, uh, turn of the 19th century, when people were trying to find whether there is something called an ether or something, this absolute frame with which everything is measured. And uh, there are some very famous experiments called the Michelson Morley experiments, which actually tried to figure out whether this thing even makes sense to have something like an absolute rest frame with which everything is measured. Uh, and they found a negative result, but they couldn't figure out why that was the case. Now, so just with that backdrop, let me change gears a little bit to tell you what change does change between frames. We already know what changes between frames. Measurements change between frames. Laws don't, measurements do. So one of the uh, ramifications of this is called the Doppler effect. So this is like a schematic. You've all heard of like a ambulance passing by at some point of the other, yes? When it's far away, it makes that annoying sound. When it comes closer, it gets louder. And then it just goes away into the distance, still making you perturbed or something. So to give a little example. Perhaps you I can demonstrate. That sound from Big Bang Theory. Oh, if you want it again, I can do it again. I can demonstrate yeah. that. So that effectively is Sheldon, Sheldon uh, cosplaying as the Doppler effect itself. So what is basically happening is that if a source is stationary uh, over here, it's basically emitting sound waves at some uh, frequency and with some wavefront. Now, when it's moving, it basically punches up those wavefronts towards the person. What would happen is whatever was oscillating languishly over here now has to oscillate faster to fit in because the source will always keep on emitting a set number of wavefronts in a set amount of time. So it's like before I had enough space to fit five. Now I've, I've, short, I've shot out enough to fit five, but then I have space enough. I have lesser space than I could have gotten. So effectively the wavelength shrinks. So this is called uh, a blue shift. Why? Because when wavelengths get shorter, it's basically more bluer, the light gets more bluer. So it's called the blue shift. The exact opposite thing happens uh, in the other situation when things are moving away over here, where the wavefronts now are more squashed in this side and they're more expanded in the other side. So now all of the wavelengths, as you can see over here, they get stretched out. Wavelength stretching out means frequency going down, and you basically have redshift. So as I said, these are called blue shifted things, and this is basically redshift. So this is called the Doppler effect, the classical Doppler effect, nothing to do with relativity, nothing to do with anything. And this is something you hear all the time whenever you have loud cars passing by. Exact same thing, just Doppler effect. And it's not as pedestrian as you think because people actually use this to measure things about the stars, about how far they are, how you get other information about how, how much in the past they are, et cetera, et cetera. So might seem pedestrian, definitely is. Now, so this is the way to define it, that there's an apparent change in frequency due to relative motion between the observer and the source, right? Now, what else changes? Velocities change, right? So suppose you're on a station and there's a local passing by, and you see from the window of the local that somebody's throwing something through. Maybe they're having a fight, always happens, you know. So if that is happening, you see the local passing, you see the person throwing the ball with velocity u inside the, train. So what is the velocity that you would see outside? What, would, what is the velocity that this person would see? Any guesses? Come on, speak up. Any guesses? It's an easy answer. It's just there. <laughs> just make it out. <laughs> no, no, they, they, they would just add up. If they were going in the opposite direction, for example, if the person was throwing the ball this way and the train was moving in the other direction, this person would see a difference in the velocity. So they would apparently think that it's going in the other direction. So velocities add up. But then now, if velocities can add up, 
you might ask what about light i just told you in the first or second slide that light has a fixed so according to einstein light has a fixed velocity in every frame every inertia whenever i say frames in this talk i have always been inertia so now you want to ask okay what happens to light would i have if i'm moving with some velocity this would basically mean that my velocity of light would be more but so and then you want to ask what about electric and magnetic fields as well so your electric fields are i mean they're all magnets people know electric fields are basically what happens when you put a potential and you see something happening like you're flowing a current or something else but what turns out is the laws of electromagnetism which are the laws of laws which govern electric and magnetic fields are not compatible with kinetic invariance which means that if i have the laws of electromagnetism in my frame where i'm stationary versus say somebody else's frame over there who's moving with a constant velocity they will actually see that the laws change so this is something that people were coming trying to grapple with where okay if we have one set of laws which are actually not changing when i change frames we have another set of laws which actually describe or have experimental evidence which now changes so people were trying to think well which one do we keep which one is more correct and so on so forth this was happening around the start of the 19th uh, yeah start of the 20th century now this is the cue for our person einstein here's where the second postulate of relativity comes in the speed of light in vacuum he basically said forget all of that stop trying to push these things together and try to marry uh, them together when they're not trying to be together he just said well i choose that laws of electromagnetism are correct meaning that speed of light uh, is same in every inertia frame this is what we choose right now what are the implications of this right there are many and as you can see this time dilation this length contraction something called relativistic doppler effect there's something called relativistic aberration there's an energy mass correspondence which is basically this a more generic form of e equal to mc square and many many more now all of these are counterintuitive why do i say that because time dilation basically means or basically implies that if i move faster my clocks become slower sounds weird yes no i have one nice two notes thanks enough enough statistics for today so length contraction is well length contraction means if i start uh, running faster the lengths that i will see will become shorter right nice way to lose weight eh? so but okay and i come to what relativistic doppler effect is it's the same idea where you basically your frequencies get shifted because of relative motion but before it was motion when you were coming towards or away if the thing was moving this way or that way the length between the source and the observer wouldn't change so there was no idea of squishing and or extending but now you can see that even if it's moving a uh, perpendicular to how you are you'll still get an effect so that's one little crux of relativistic doppler effect aberration i'll come to energy mass correspondence i'll come to so they're very counterintuitive these effects right but then you you might have the question that okay you're telling me on a sunday morning that there are all sorts of weird things happening but i don't see it so why do i care right so i mean in every day in so what people say is in real life i don't see this is some theoretical hogwash or something so by real life people mean everyday life right so the reason simply is that the velocity of light in vacuum is extremely large it's three times approximately three times 10 to the power 5 kilometers per second to give you a idea uh the galaxy for example galaxies are going around each other at around 350 kilometers per second so this is around what can somebody try to do the math for me how many times thousand thousand times <laughs> okay so these are like thousand times the that velocity as well for example um at best uh, we would go at some kilometers per hour on earth while driving and that doesn't hold a candle to this at all right so this is a giant effect and then what we'll see later is that all of these effects that i'm talking about they have factors of velocity over c so just because you move at certain the amount the axis we have to velocity ranges is so narrow that these effects become really tiny we are not able to see it 
in real life. Real life. The point is that what we'll what I'll try to show you is that you actually can see them in real life. You can actually measure these things, and you can actually show that these things are real and it is supported. Right. So in a nutshell, at very high velocities, Newton's laws of motion really work. And you have to switch them out with Einstein's special theory of relativity, which is started in 1905. And that's basically what you have to do if you want to work at high velocities. Now, I just wanted to give you an idea of, uh, before going on to the other parts of this, now that I've sort of made a small case for why uh, we have to look at relativity, let me just tell you how relativity pictures events happening and so on. So what is the base uh, layer of relativity? So have you ever heard of a flip book, right? If you haven't, this is what a flip book is with the stupid shark dancing and whatnot. So basically you have a lot of images which you draw on individual pieces of paper. And then when you flip it through, you stack them for, uh, vertically. When you flip them through, you get an animation, right? So it's the same way that space-time, which you probably have heard in some places here and there, uh, is built. Basically, you take multiple snapshots and then you stack them up one on top of other, right? To create a three-dimensional object. Suppose our world was two-dimensional for a moment. In that situation, you would take multiple snapshots at different points of time and you would just stack them up on top of each other in the time direction. And that would create a 3D volume of space time. If you do the same thing for um, three dimensional space or real life, if you take snapshots of 3D spaces and then stack them up and create what is a 4D space, of course, very hard to sort of imagine and stuff, but it's the same procedure which is happening. At every point of time, you have a 3D space. Every point of time, you have a 3D space, and then so on and so forth. And things are moving around, right? So this is what I'm showing over here again, that you take snapshots of space at a later time, at a time at this moment, and an earlier time, and you just stack them back up. If something wasn't moving during these snapshots, they'll be at the exact same point in every snapshot. Yes? Good. So that is the thing. Something which is not moving just remain at the same place. Now, suppose there was this little light uh, quanta, which was actually emitted from this point. So if I take a snapshot at time t equal to zero, it will be somewhere over here. If I take a snapshot later, it has moved at this point over here. At a much later time slot, it has moved even more. So it's basically moving this way. Yeah. And you get these kind of a line. So these are called world lines of any object. So you have space, like a 2D space, like I told you. And then you stack things up on time to create space time like this. right? Now, in case of Newtonian stuff, or for, okay, let me give examples. So if you take a cartoon of the Earth rotating around the sun, so this is the sun. So the Earth is just rotating around in January to July, October in different, different places. This black dot over here is the Earth. And you, then you just take these pictures and stack them up, right? So you're January, April, July, October. And then effectively, now you just join these points. Right? So this effectively will be rotating. So it comes here, goes there, goes back again, and then goes up. So this is the world line of the Earth when I actually consider it in space time. If you look at looking at it in 2D. But why am I spending time on this at the end of the day? Because this is something that is going to be very important for STR and more importantly for the general theory of relativity, which actually Einstein proposed in 1916 or 17, I don't remember. So, um, and that has revolutionized our idea of relativity even more. That closes the picture. Uh, to give you a little bit of a taste, all of these postulates that I was talking about, STR is all about two postulates, but all of the postulates mentioned inertial frames. Yes. What is STR? Oh, special theory of relativity, my bad. So uh, I will keep using, my bad, that's a, probably an occupational hazard, but, uh, so um, yeah, special theory, fine, I'll just call it special theory. So if you're in the special theory, the special part about it is that you're only looking at inertial frames. Anything that moves with an acceleration, you, you basically say, eh, I don't know. And that part is what came up in the general theory of relativity, where you now put in accelerated frames as well. And you try to do a more complete analysis. A lot more stuff happens there. This is barely grazing the surface. 
and this is not it can be an entire talk on its own so we're not going to go there but all of this is important when you actually go to uh, general theory of relativity and what is going to be very important is this that here for example look i was having motion in space right things were moving around like that now when i actually created their world lines i got a shape out of it yes at the end of the day all kinds of dynamics will reduce to just having different kinds of shapes right so you can have this thing where motion in space can be replaced by shapes in space time and then studying motion becomes a study of shapes and this is where you have all of these uh, cartoons and ideas about ooh space time is something like a fabric there's a planet sitting there it's uh, bending space time and all of that this is what they mean that you have something space you have something called space time as we have defined over here and because and that geometry of that shape gets deformed when i put in masses and other things inside and that has effects because because the geometry has changed the motion in space only has also changed so it's like a proxy for looking at what happens in motion this is the more general way of looking but then i'll stop it over there and just move back to the special theory of relativity oh before doing that i told you the title of the talk today was the absolute speed and what i'm trying to tell you is that the speed of light in vacuum is that actually act, uh, is that um ultimate speed limit which you can go beyond no material particle can go beyond right if that is the case what would space time even look like right just to give you a contrast think about newtonian stuff where there is no speed we just pump more energy to go faster right simple idea completely a general field just press down on the accelerator you just go faster right so that means that if i go back over here if i start at this point i can in principle reach anywhere i want right i can move at any speed what does moving at a speed even mean this was moving at a speed which means that i have a slanted line right if i move at a faster speed this slant will increase from the vertical from the horizontal it becomes lower from the vertical the slant will increase and keep on increasing in principle i could go at infinite speed which means that it's just horizontal and i can reach anywhere in space time right this is what classical uh, stuff would tell me but when you go to special theory of relativity uh what you now have to look at is that okay i have light which is an absolute bound on how fast i can move yeah so in that situation what the space time can look like so suppose you have a explosion happening here which lets out light in one direction like this right yeah so or you can have an implosion where light actually comes in and this is coming towards each other right so this is a hypothetical case the implosion part it is it's slightly hypothetical for a uh, light but bear with me so now hopefully this works yes it is working can you see this little uh, red thing over here so it's it's going in 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 and then it just the thing loops and then you, you have a little red thing going out is that visible yes okay. so if i were to but this is just in space now remember what we talked about it just takes snapshots stack them up yeah so we do just that we start from the implosion uh, front so we start again so i start from here go here 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 i come at the point where i want to look at stuff and then it goes out so it creates a nice little cone for me right where this is this slope is effectively gives me the velocity of light in vacuum right it also means that nothing can go outside this cone if i'm sitting over here there's no way i can go outside I, whatever happens i have to stay inside because i always have to have velocity speeds lower than the speed of light remember not moving at all was completely vertical moving at infinite speed was horizontal right that's why i always stay within this so these are with very imaginative naming sense as you can obviously see we got light cones so now so as i was telling you that str basically tells you that these are like a cosmic speed limit you can go beyond this right so what that means that if you want to have a causative uh 
relation between events, meaning that I do something and that influences something else to happen, right? It can happen that I'm just here, this is something is beyond my uh, sphere of influence and something else is happening. It's not what is technically called causally connected to me. I cannot cause that, that thing cannot, uh, I cannot have any effect on that, that thing cannot have any effect on me. To give you an example, for example, I cannot have any effect on what is happening in Ukraine, although I would like to, but uh, unfortunately I don't. I only have a very tiny effect, but okay, it's a bad example, but anyway. Uh, so, um, yeah. So now what I basically want to say is the light cones partition space time around each point into three zones. Yeah. So zone one is the future, meaning that if I'm at a point, what will I influence in the future? What kind of effects can I actually have? What kind of events can I influence? Right. Which has to be in the light cone itself. Yes. That's what we talked about. It cannot influence anything outside. So whatever has to be, it has to be inside. There's a past accordingly. The fact that I'm here, I'm accumulation of all my past experiences. But what is the range of my past experiences? Is bounded within this light cone again. Because since, again, since the velocity of light is constant, nothing can exceed it. Nothing outside can actually come in and influence me at the present. And then there is what is called space like separated. These are the points which I cannot reach anymore, starting from where I am. And of course, since you have a future of the past, this is your best. That's all. So these are the three zones that you have. Now you can technically have a light cone at each point in space time as well, right? And now you can have, say, a trajectory saying that, okay, I started out over here. I keep on moving. I, I'm at this point at this time, this point at this time, this point at this time. So if I were to actually make a trajectory through this, the fact that I'm starting here and ending up here means that I have to be within this cone when I'm exiting this point, and I have to be within this cone when I'm exiting, uh, when I'm entering this point. So there's sort of like a area through which I have to go in. That is the entrance to that point. I cannot move otherwise, right? So this is one possible path. You can have other possible paths. I can start at the same point, go through different trajectories, but then come back again. That's not a problem. So you can have different paths, but there are severe constraints on the paths as well. Why? Because at each point you have light going inside. Of course, to construct these, you don't actually need light. You don't have to always have a torch on you which says that, okay, I can only go this much or I only go that much. This is something that the theory of space-time itself will just tell you. Special theory of relativity will itself tell you, you can't move. If you want to actually influence something, physically influence something, you cannot move. So there are cases where people say that, oh, well, I shone a laser at the moon and I moved it and it's faster than light. Yeah, but you can't actually communicate with that thing. Nothing can get communicated. So there are things which are super luminal, but they don't convey information. Yeah, so there's an apparently moving uh, at speeds greater than C. So uh, entire range of possibilities, past is the entire range of possibilities that you can come from. Now, let me go back to STR, right? So remember that uh, quite a few slides back, I told you about what comes from STR, yeah? I told you about, uh, oh, sorry, I'm going in opposite direction. Maybe I should have flashed that slide over here. Anyway. Yeah, okay, right. So I talked about these effects over here, right? Time dilation, time contraction, relativistic Doppler effect, etc., etc., etc. Right. So now let us actually at least try to figure out how this thing even comes about. Right. So I have to keep on clicking again. Bear with me. So the point is, before we actually start talking about how uh, time dilation happens, let's think about how we even measure time. Right. So, does the people have an idea how time is measured? How would you measure time with a watch? Right. What if you didn't have a watch? Okay, that's a good idea. So, how would you measure time with the sun? I forgot who's talking. Sir, you got huh? a sundial. A sundial, exactly. So how? So thank you for bringing that up. So you have a sundial. So how do you actually? 
get a time reading from a sundial. Exactly. So the shadow has to be some point at some point of time in the day, and that is your reference. It moves to another point, and you say that okay, this much is this much. You have a way of indexing how much it has moved to how much time has passed. So that is the idea. You have, you need two events: the event that it was at the reference, event that some other reference got passed, and then you take a difference. Then you map it onto something. Right. That's the basic idea of measuring time. and that is exactly how we do it we have a much fancier sun so for example this is what is happening over here so instead of a sundial event there are two events happening here i have a bit of light starts from here goes to the other one comes back right so my events are this thing came out of here and this thing sort or rather it sort of bounced here and then bounced here if that entire thing happens once i count one period it's like a pendulum right So if you take a pendulum, it's going from here to here. One entire swing is one period. That's a unit of time. That's how you define it, right? The more precise way of doing it, with without pendulums and so on and so forth, is what are called is what are called atomic clocks, right? Here, the two events are basically a transition happening from one level to another level, right? And then I thought I have to stop the minutes. So. and then a one second currently is defined as this ungodly number of vibrations of the unperturbed ground state hyperfine transition frequency of cesium 132 break it down there's an atom there are different states in that atom which are very precisely tuned the transitions that happen their energies are very precise meaning that the frequency of that transition is very very precise right which means that these many number of oscillations will happen in one second so people have figured that out there's a entire history of how that happened which i won't be able to go into that becomes a talk of itself uh, probably a talk even at a graduate school level but this is how it's defined so the two uh, events that you have is uh, a transition happening and then it's also right and this is to give you an example that these things are also happening not too far away from here in pune So people are actually setting up these experiments to actually do precision measurements of time. Why is it important? Because you use time to index a lot of things, like say stock market transactions or precision measurements of different things. You need to know time. Even for example, we, uh, the last time why Prithvi was about James Webb Space Telescope. Yes. So when you're actually trying to communicate with a satellite that far away, you have to have precise control of time to actually understand where is it at what point of time, whether is it whether it's getting uh of course or whether something is not functioning at the right point of time everything is crucial so this level of precision is the best we have it's well, not exactly this is the standard probably people have better but it's not been standardized yet but this is how we measure time this is the best we have standardized at this moment now what would happen if i take the earlier setup that i have over here and actually make the clock move So here you have the usual setup, stationary at one point, light going up, back and forth, back and forth. What if I take another clock and start making it move at constant velocity with respect to the other? Right. Again, remember, just by design, the time it will actually measure is the time between the two events happening. Right. So I need, whether it's moving or not, I don't care. At the end of the day, I need a light pulse to start from here. do whatever it wants to do bounce back from that point and come back that's clear right great now you have to find out that okay what will happen when i actually do that that's when i take a seat and break out my theorist pen because that's the biggest occupational hazard i have now suppose yeah suppose this length is l you all you guys can see right great cool but it stopped is it and yeah, well fine that's okay so if this thing is moving with a velocity v yeah if this thing is moving with a velocity v and suppose this entire event where it goes up this way and then comes back down takes a time delta t fair 
and we want to find what this delta t is in terms of the velocity length and speed of light these are the things that we know and we want to find this delta t so if it has gone for time delta t then for sure this distance is basically v times delta t just velocity times time that's length fair now we want to find this entire length over here now we call upon our old arch nemesis pythagoras and figure out what this length is right so for um, for convenience purposes let them let me call this two delta t so that i have a cute little situation where i have a cute situation where i can call this is v delta t up to here and this is v delta t up to here yeah this length using pythagoras would be just l square v square delta t square same as this right excuse my atrocious handwriting but bear with me if something is not clear just holler so the total length now is just this and this has been traversed at the speed of light because our good friend einstein basically told us that whatever frame you take as long as they are inertial the speed of light is c end of story so even in this moving frame the speed of light was c so if i want to find out the time it took i just divide length by velocity I divide by c and i should get back delta t which is because that's of two delta t sorry that was that's what i started from i assumed that the total time was two delta t i found a formula for two delta t if i simplify what i'll get is that delta t is equal to uh l square uh no sorry yes delta t is l over c times 1 minus v square by c square this is what i got just take it for granted for now because I mean, we want to do something cooler than solve math on a zoom thing right so, so this is what the delta t happens in the moving frame now in not moving frame basically the total distance that got traversed is 2l right and just divide by c right so if i take half of that because delta t is half i basically get l over c so in the moving so in the rest frame i basically had i basically had l over c as my time period and in the moving frame it gets amplified by this little factor over here why do i call it amplified because c v over c is just a fraction 1 minus fraction is again a fraction square root of that is also a fraction to divide something by a fraction it becomes larger yeah so this is what is called a relativistic factor gamma factor so this is what we are going to talk about maybe i need to just kill this first what do i want okay fine right so zoom is pesky there we go right so this is that factor that we were talking about this is that factor we were talking about this is called a gamma factor and this gamma factor is the one factor that rules almost all relativistic effects why does it why, why is that the case because this comes up in your fundamental definition of time right now the way you measure time itself gets stretched out whenever you're moving at a constant velocity with respect to each other now this is what is what i'm plotting over here is v in units of c i'm looking at the fraction between the velocity you're traveling at and the velocity of light remember light velocity was 3 times 10 to the power 8 meter per second i'm converting kilometer per second to meter per second that gives an extra factor of 3 and typically for example usain bolt's fastest speed is slightly more than 10 meter per second so there's like seven orders of magnitude like a crore times more than usain bolt of course he's not really a reference but then it gives you an idea at all if at all so as you can see if i look at really tiny value so if i look at if i try to put usain bolt somewhere over here he will be somewhere here 
I mean, this is already exaggerated. It will be somewhere where I can't even plot. At that point, gamma is nothing but one, meaning that there is no factor, there is no effect at all, because the effect is so, so low. Right? And this is why you don't see any relativistic effect in your everyday life, because the velocities that we can actually move at are so tiny that we can't actually measure or feel anything by ourselves. I will actually show you an example where we can measure this, and that's a feat in itself. And just see that if I go to like half of the velocity of light, even over here, the factor is like maybe 1.2. Okay, fine, nothing that great. By the time I reach 0.8, it's getting closer to two. Again, not that bad. But between point eight and one, you can see that this thing starts rising rapidly, right? This is like what you would do in front of a deadline, right? You just, you just keep dead all this time. Suddenly a deadline comes up and you're like, no, I have to do everything at the same time, right? And that's normal. That's human nature. There's actually physics behind that as well, which if you want, uh, you can look at Parisi's talk because he's actually done research on this. So, um, and so you can see if I'm at 9.9 C somewhere over here, it's quite large. If I'm at 0.99 C, it's somewhere over here. And this curve never stops. If you go to one, this entire thing diverges. This entire thing is going to infinity and beyond, right? And this is at the heart of all relativistic effects. This is the gamma factor, which gives you um, time dilation which also will give you length contraction, which I'll come to in a minute. But first, let us I told you a lot of things, wrote a lot of stuff, but then being a discerning audience that you are, you can basically ask me like, okay, but you said that I don't have any effect. It sounds a little too convenient, isn't it? Whatever I can measure, whatever I can see in real life is not influenced by this. How do I care? How do I even know it exists? Can I actually measure it? The question is, the answer is yes, you can. So if I were to clear these things, one, right. So let me talk to you about experimental tests of time dilation. So right now, what I'm showing you over here is the is basically um, cosmic ray showers, right? So you've all sort of seen videos of the Northern Lights and so on and so forth. Yes, they're really beautiful, and it's one on my bucket list to try and go there at some point, hopefully someday. But then the reason behind it is basically cosmic rays coming from outside, uh, from space, bombarding on the atmosphere of the Earth and then creating different kinds of light. So it's very high energy. These rays are of very high energy. They knock out electrons, create all sorts of luminescence. And that's what you see as an order lights. So to give you sort of a, a cartoon picture of what is happening, these cosmic rays basically start up over there and then they start interacting with whatever they can find in the atmosphere, right? And all of these little white lines, these little twigs that you see are little particles being shot out and every sort of branch point is where they actually interact. So literally these things are called cosmic ray showers because of these things, because actually that is what's happening because every time it passes through, it bumps into this, that, this, that, and it creates an entire cascade of things, right? But then, okay, why do I care, right? So the point is that these things, one of the particles inside these cosmic rays uh, is called a muon. Uh, it's just a cousin of the electron, but just it's very unstable. What does that mean? An electron by itself has some lifetime. It, uh, it stays by itself for a while. The muon basically dies between a microsecond, 10 to the power minus six seconds, which is tiny, yeah? But then, okay, and muons also, you know, that since they have very little mass, the kind of things that they're actually coming in, they actually can move at speeds which are very close to the speed of light, like 0.9 of the speed of light, right? So at that speed, effectively, the muon should die out uh, by the time it has traveled through um, some length scale, which is the lifetime times the speed, right? After that time, it doesn't simply exist. So, okay, it has died. Turns out that if it actually has to reach the Earth's surface over here, starting from there, if it has to reach, then it has to actually spend 50 microseconds. So a microsecond is 10 to the power minus six seconds. So the lifetime is 2.2, but to reach the actual surface, it needs 50. So 25 times the actual time it has. Yeah. 
And then you can say, okay, fine, it's some weird particle, it's doing something, like why do I care? The point is that you can actually measure these things. You can measure muons on the surface of the earth. So this is, for example, a TIFR owned, sponsored, I don't know, yeah. owned. So uh, it's a TIFR owned facility in Uti, which actually has all of these little tiny things are scintillation detectors, which look at muons. So they're, they're like a little brick of plastic. If a muon passes through, it creates a tiny spark of light. And all of these are all uh, in the encasing so that even that tiny spark of light, which with the naked eye you will never be able to see, actually gets amplified enough to an electrical signal. And this entire large array over here is something like a detector which looks at how much muons are passing through. And what people find is muons actually reach the Earth's surface. Even though it's 25 times, it's like 25 lifetimes. You're looking at a thing which should die out in one year, but 25 years later, you see the guy still like hell and hearty good going around. Ideally, if it was a human being, you'll say it's a scam, right? But turns out that is not a scam. This is relativity at play. What happens simply is our good old gamma factor. Yeah. Remember that I told you in the earlier plot over here that when I get closer to this, this thing jumps by an ungodly amount. And because the speed of the muon is so large, the gamma factor actually can uh, turn out to be something like 25. So it's out of the scale somewhere over there, or even above if you want. Right? And because of this gamma factor, you can actually measure muons on that and make sense. So what is actually happening? You can say, OK, there's a gamma factor, etc. But what is the actual intuitive understanding? The fact is that if something is moving, its clock is running slower simply because you have, so from the perspective of the muon, the muon itself feels like it only has gone up to 2.2 the lifetime. But from the outside, because I'm, I'm seeing the muon move, I actually measure its time to be large. What's the, what's the basic physics of it? It's because the light has a finite speed of traveling. Even if it's very large, it is finite, right? And if you are actually um, moving at a speed which is close to that, you are now going to have effects between them as well. So that is the basic physical understanding behind time dilation. Uh, time dilation. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> fifty minutes up. Huh? Okay. Sure. I uh, we are we done the speed run. Right. So you can say that okay, it's very appreciable for really large uh, velocities, but can you actually measure something when at low velocity? Turns out, and this is a surprise for me as well, because I didn't know about this before the talk, that um, you can actually measure this, even at velocities like 10 meters per second. Remember, Usain Bolt's velocity was 10 meters per second. Somebody can actually measure how much Usain Bolt's clock gets slower while he's running. To give you an idea, this number is 10 to the power minus 15. Right? People can actually measure this. And they can actually show that it, it, so this blue line over here is the relativistic prediction. So what is happening here is you have an ion trapped over here. An ion basically means that it's two levels again. Remember, you need two events to have uh, transitions. These are two events over here. We just make them sit at a different place where the ions start jiggling around a lot. So they acquire an RMS velocity, uh, average velocity, right? And because of that velocity, now then you measure how much the Doppler effect kicks in, right? Remember Doppler effects were about differences between energy because of relative motion. Now there is relative motion happening and this arrow is basically measuring uh, time for you. And then you actually see that the data fits the, exp uh, the expectation very well. So people can actually measure this for things which are moving at our speeds as well. To move on, um, I'll probably skip this for the moment. I'll do it afterwards. Let me do something cool. Let's play a game. Not a saw game, not that bad, but let's play a game. So the game we're trying to play is called Slower Speed of Light. So this is a game which was made by the MIT Game Lab. You can find the page at this QR code and you can download the game as well over here. It's a fully relativistic open source game engine. It means that anybody can use it. Anybody can design their own games on it. And it takes into account all possible relativistic effects but then I, right now I showed you that at low velocities, well, nothing happens, right? 
So what they do, their premise is to just slow down light, to artificially make C close to your walking speed and see what happens. And then we're going to basically play this game and see all the kind of things that happen. So let me try and pull that up. I'm going to do it in window no. So it takes a moment to sort of organize itself. Let it, let it, let it come here. It's here, right? No, not yet on YouTube. Just wait. Just oh, wait. Sure, Just sure. Give it some time to get on YouTube. Sure. It's about a 10 second delay. So, okay. Go for it. Okay. That's a very technical question. Yeah, we'll take it later. That's a very technical question. Something which I don't think I'm qualified to answer. Uh, I'll simply say I don't know. Right. You guys can see the screen, right? So should I read it out or should I give you time to read it? Just read it out. Please. Okay. Once upon a time, in a quiet village, there was a little child. And obviously it doesn't. Sadly, the little child fell into death's icy grip far too soon. The little child's spirit began the journey to become one with light. But the speed of light was too fast for the small and clumsy little spirit. Luckily, the spirit world is full of magical orbs that slow down light. And then this is the purpose of the game. Collect orbs to slow down light to walking speed so you can finally move on. So you see how many orbs that you have collected. And here is a gauge of your speed. This white line is the speed of light. The more orbs you collect, this thing becomes slower and slower and slower. So when you start moving, your velocity becomes closer to the speed of light. And as light gets slower, you get to see more than what you normally can see, meaning that things in the infrared get blue shifted into visible, things in the ultraviolet get red shifted into the visible as well. So let's see, these are the controls. And what I will basically be doing once this game works is to pass around this keyboard to people who want to play and we're gonna move around. Sounds like a deal? Yes, no? Pretty cold on it. Let, let's just choose two players and get them here. No, that's probably easier. Okay, fine. Just this round because... raise of hands. Who wants to play? Anyone wants to play? <coughs> Come down. Right. So, don't be shy. It's fine. Come down. Just come here. Sit, sit. Yes, yeah, sit down. Sit down. You can just take this if you want. Right, so the keys to move around are W A is not W is two, so more pro gamer things. So um, and then, so it also requires you to move around your orientation with the uh, thing. So before collecting anything, could you just move in this direction? Just press W. So if you move forward, what do you notice? Things become a bit bluer. If you move backwards, things become a bit more red. Right. Mm -hmm. That's exactly Doppler effect that we were talking about. Now try to collect this thing in front of you. Just go forward and bump it. Right? That's fine, that's fine. Calm down, calm down. So now you collected a orb. Now let's try to collect, go up, uh, go straight. Go on, go on, go on. We're going to collect all of these orbs. Just stop it. Try to move straight. 
So you see that the effect becomes more and more blue. Yes. Now just pause. Pause, pause, pause. Try to go back. So the reddening effect got uh, larger as well. Try to move sideways. S. You see that one side of the screen got redder, the other side got bluer. Yeah. So all this means is that the side which I'm moving towards gets bluer, the side which I'm moving against gets redder. So this is what is called transverse Doppler effect. In the classical way that I explained to you, if you were moving towards or away, you would get things getting redder or uh, bluer. That's what we saw. Earlier. And now this is the transverse effect, but even if the distance between you two is not changing vertically or longitudinally, it can happen in the transverse direction as well. So this is a relativistic effect. Try to collect more orbs, go ahead. Going, keep going. I'll just orient you towards them. Right, now what do you see? If you try to move straight, try to move straight, you see that things are starting to get greener, right? Yeah? Try to move, go ahead. Keep moving. So it becomes more and more weirder. Yeah? Very weird, in fact. So just stop for a moment. Stop. What are the effects you saw right now? Things becoming very green, very weird. Did you also notice that? Try to move backwards for a little bit. Did you see that the space starts looking like it's stretching? Right? So that is the effect of length contraction and time dilation that they're programmed into this. The fact that when I'm moving at a speed, right now, remember your speed is actually that white line over there, right? This white line is the speed of light and you move up to this speed. So the more orbs you collect, the, low, the larger that fraction of V over C gets because I'm artificially reducing C, right? And the gamma factor becomes more and more efficient. Try to collect more orbs. At this point, wait, I should, could you just hand it over to her? So go ahead, collect orbs. We have to start. Okay, these three. Oh. Right, just go backwards. S. Very red, right? Now, did you notice something over here? Just go forward a bit. Just keep going forward. You see that the middle of the screen becomes brighter for a moment. Yeah. So this is also an effect called the spotlight effect. Simply, see, light is coming towards you from all sorts of directions. If you move more towards something, more of it will hit you in your face. Simple as that, like raindrops. Yeah. So simply, if you're moving towards ambient light faster, you'll have more light collecting on your face and the central part of your uh, spot will become brighter. That's basically the spotlight effect. Right? Try to go backwards. You see the mushrooms are glowing for a moment. Try okay. I'm going to overtake you for a moment and try to drive home this point. So now I'm going to move back for a bit. You see the mushrooms are all weirdly colored. Yeah. Does anyone know that mushrooms glow under UV light? Right. This is one way to check what mushroom it is, whether it has any psychoactive components, whether it has any poisonous components. So what you're basically seeing. If you look at, so if I move again, you see that the bottom bar is actually becoming extended, which means that that much amount of light, which was beyond your visual range before, you can see now because it got red shifted or blue shifted into your, uh, into the range where your eyes can see. So now you can actually start seeing uh, things which you could not see before, right? So uh, try to move around. Let's see, let's see what's next. Oh, there we go. Go, go straight, go straight. Keep going. So now when you're moving to the left, you see that there's a spectrum of colors as well. So there's a red shift, there's a blue shift, and there's all sorts of shifts happen. Go straight, collect them. Oh, no, you, why are you being shy? Just run, if you bonk into a rock, it's fine. 
I'm really missing some effects. Uh, no, it's fine. I'll, I'll tell you to stop. Right now, I just enjoy the fact that this is a trip without anything. So, okay, good. So, you see that length is already changing in weird ways, right? Let's find more orbs so that we can speed run this. Oh, like that. So, this is what you're seeing is IR. So, I'm going to go backwards for you. Yeah, go forward. Keep going forward. So what you're seeing here, all the redness is basically IR spectrum. Go again, go again. And then, okay. It does anybody else want to play? Yes, no. Otherwise, I'm going to speed run this. Yeah. Speed run, speed run. Speed run. Okay, fine. Well. Yeah, yeah. Sorry for this. I spoke too long. But... So you realize that it gets weirder and weirder. Yeah. Then this is the annoying part. Because now orienting yourself will also take a lot of effort. So as you can see, this is why you had the warning right at the start that it may cause issues with people with epilepsy or this is going to take some time if anybody has questions you can ask right now go ahead okay uh, let's see mm -hmm. um i think this is probably from a student who's asking why the shape of a cone why the shape of a cone for the light cone ah so simply that you expect the velocity of light at every point in vacuum to be the same so that's why you can just say that well i keep on extending it and it's just going to go at the same speed it's not so the shape is determined by the speed right if the speed is the same the shape is the same however way you actually go okay are there any questions on facebook if there are please just put them in the uh, zoom chat Right. No, there is no question on Facebook. Okay. Thanks. Okay. All right. It's becoming intensely harder to do as always. Because now you can see how bad the um, gamma factors are because it's extending things to an impossible level. Actually, there are comp there where so this was introduced in 2012, where people wanted to actually make this kind of an engine and visualize relativity. And back when it was uh, introduced, people actually made a game out of it to speed run this. You see that I was so far away, but now because of length and uh, time dilation and length and traction, I don't even know how far I've moved. Like this goes against every conception that you probably. Yeah, I think the question was, yeah, if one, the confusion is if speed is the same, why is it a cone and not a sphere? Ah, so the cone that so okay, the cone that actually happens is in 4D space, which is very hard to visualize. What I was showing you is a test example where space was two dimensions and uh, and uh, time was the other direction. So you know that if you take sections at every point of time, it was a circle. So in three dimensions, every section at time will be a sphere. So you're right, spheres do happen, but in the 3D space part of it. In time part, it's like larger and larger spheres stacked together in time, which is very hard to sort of uh, imagine. But yes, you're right. Spheres will happen, but in space, not in time. So now you're at an extreme level that you can see that the spotlight effect has basically washed out everything else. And these specters that were basically moving around are more of specters than at any point of time before. E. So this is the only hard part of the game, if you want. So just bear with me. This will be done. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can you just tell people what is the source of the game again? So if they want to yeah, download sure, it. Sure, 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 uh, sure. So this is, this is called the slower speed of light. If you actually uh, saw the slide, it had a QR code on which you can uh, scan this, but I will also send the reference in, uh, they will be posted in the YouTube link later. Yeah. So um, 
now it's becoming harder to even orient myself. But yeah, this is like a very tiny game. This graphics looks like it's very demanding, but it's actually not at all demanding. You can easily run it on a system like that. So I've actually given uh, the link to the game and the link uh, download link for it, which will run with all proper effects, etc. So now you can see that these effects are getting so weird that it's almost impossible. So if you look at the white line on the corner, you're basically moving very close to the speed of light where everything gets weirder. Okay, 11 more to go. I need to just find them and get this done. Ah, another thing. You see that if I move forward, everything becomes very bright. I haven't moved backward yet. Let's see what happens when I move backward. Can you guess what is why this is happening? Yeah, light can't catch up to me. Simply light can't catch up to you. And you're going to see darkness. So in a relativistic world, moving backwards is very scary. Very scary. At least that's what I felt when I was playing it at 2 a.m. Okay, hey, listen. I think yeah. uh, we'll continue the game. No, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's sort of uh, yes. ask the online audience last chance for questions. If you have any, please put them in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll put in the uh, game details in the YouTube link later. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you want to ask uh, Sharna some questions, I just see if there are any. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Anything on YouTube? I can check. Okay. Uh, okay. It's been put in the, the chat and it's already been put in the YouTube. So uh, yeah. with this, I think we will take a break. Sure. And uh, the, the in-person audience, we will take a break and have chai. If somebody wants to play, you can come here. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Play. And uh, online audience, thank you so much for watching. Uh, we'll stop the live stream right now. Uh, yeah. But you can always post us questions at outreach, O U T R E A C H, at pifr.res.in. And uh, see you again two weeks from now in our holy special Chai and Y as well. And remember, it will be in person as well. So you could also come to Uparel College and watch that as well. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to end the live stream now. Just can you wait like one minute wait. because yeah, sure, this sure. will. This... Oh, you're already in 97. Yeah, we'll wait. We'll wait. So, yeah. So now, once you have actually collected everything, you are basically going to walk at the speed of light. Now, see what is going to happen. The only thing you're going to stop at are these rocks over here because you can't phase through things still, even if you're moving at light speed. So, here they have taken off all the other coloring effects that you were seeing before. They just want to show you the distortion of space that happens. See, I told you that lengths contract and things happen weirdly. But I was always talking about lengths which were in your field of view. If you had lengths on the other parts of your view, you would basically have this lengths bending over and contracting. These are the distortion effects that you actually see. And just to show you, if you look at this white gate over here, if I can go there, let's see. So you'll see how badly it actually uh, and this white gate is the final gate to actually but something like a time warp or yeah it's all a time warp. time warp it's a time warp and it's effect of uh, so the light from the top of a rod is coming at a much later time than the light coming from the bottom of a rod so you're effectively seeing the top of the rod in the past versus uh, in that right so effectively it's it's the same way you actually look at uh, the stars the further away you look the further in the past they are the light we actually get from megaparsec kiloparsec away it actually are stars that maybe don't even exist anymore so it's actually a way to look into the past and people actually use this so yeah okay thank you thanks you live stream hopes there's chai outside yeah <laughs>